Okay, Amos 4, verse 6, for everyone, please. And uh, we are looking at uh, the second sermon, The Penalty of Pride. We've already uh, seen Amos uh, in chapter 4, uh, verses 1, actually chapter, yeah, chapter 4, beginning of verse 1, is where he works over the uh, women. But in continuing on with that penalty of pride in verse 6, he said, But I gave you also cleanness of teeth in all your cities. And so in verse 6, does that mean he gave everybody a toothbrush? <laughs> it means they're not eating. Well, toothpaste with a toothbrush. Or toothpaste. <laughs> toothbrush, toothpaste, no. Well, toothbrushes had not been invented yet, nor toothpaste to go with it. How would you have cleanness of teeth? You're not, not eating? Not eating, yeah. So that's what he said. And that's what he explains, if you just read a little bit further on. A lack of bread in all your places, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. So he said, I'm giving you some discipline, and you haven't picked up on it. Furthermore, some more discipline. I withheld the rain from you while there were still three months until harvest. Then I would send rain on one city and another city. I would not send rain. One part would be rained on, while the part not rained on would dry up. So two or three cities would stagger to another city to get water for difficult times, but would not be satisfied. Yet you have not returned to me. So that key thought is found in the latter part of verse 6. Yet you have not returned to me. Verse 8, yet you have not returned to me. Verse 10 says, yet you have not returned to me. Verse 11 says, yet you have not returned to me. So these reoccurring phrases are all the result of God's discipline being ignored. You have not returned to me. Verse 9, I smote you with scorching wind and mildew, and the caterpillar was devouring. Your many gardens and vineyards, fig trees and olive trees, yet you have not returned to me. Verse 10 continues on. I sent a plague among you after the manner of Egypt. I slew your young men by the sword, along with your captured horses, and I made the stench of your camp rise up in your nostrils, yet you have not returned to me. So those are, those are raiding parties that are coming across. And remember that the difficulty that the northern kingdom of Israel is having, and remember this is Amos from Judah to Israel. Some of you, I notice on your test, still haven't figured out the difference between Israel and Judah. I said, Prophet Elijah, where is he from? Some of you put down Judah. No, Elijah and Elisha are Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel. So you got to get that straight in your mind. I think sometimes you just look at the question and then slap down the first thing that comes into your mind, and you don't want to always do that. You want to go back and take a look. <clears throat> was that, uh, excuse me, the guy, seeing that they always went back and forth a lot on both sides, that uh, Elisha, well, Elijah and Elisha didn't, though. Well, when Elisha was, I thought it said, I read today, when Elisha was dying, the king from Judah was by his side. Well, when, uh, when, uh, when Elijah, Elijah is the one that leaves the, uh, runs away from Mount Carmel. Now he does go into Judah. Elijah goes all the way down to the land below Beersheba. So he, he goes into that land, but both of them just prophesy for the northern kingdom of Israel. They don't prophesy for the. So but was it the king? Was now, it the king from got, Judah that came over? And... You've, got, you've got the king from Judah who comes up and is killed by Jehu. You remember, and so there is some of the of the southern king of the uh, a king of the southern king. Well, two kings actually, Jehoshaphat did it also, but it's still Elijah and Elisha are prophets for the northern kingdom of Israel. But I thought when I read it, that when he was dying, when Elisha was dying, the king from Judah, his friend, was by his side saying, "Father, father." <clears throat> I will, I will, we'll go back and look at that. That doesn't. That, you may be right, but uh, that doesn't sound right. Sometimes these guys have the same name, so maybe that's. Well, that's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
So th these are raiding parties here in verse 10 that have come into the land, and that's God's discipline again. Verse 11, I overthrew you as Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were like a firebrand snatched from a blaze. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I shall do this to you. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. They sure don't want to meet him <laughs> under these circumstances. This is not an invitation to a meal. This is an invitation to destruction. For behold, he who forms mountains and creates the wind, it goes right back to creation terminology. And creation terminology <laughs> is, is used so many times when we're dealing with with uh, with the Gentiles later on, you remember that the creation terminology is used uh, in uh, Acts 17 in Athens. Creation terminology is used in Romans, the first chapter, when the Gentiles are condemned because they didn't recognize God in creation. But creation terminology, even though uh, wilderness wandering Moses terminology seems to be used more than that. The creation terminology is used even with the Jews. So this is an emphasis upon the very power of God. If he has the power to form mountains and create the wind, guess what he has, what he can do with you, little bug Israel? He'll just step on you. And declares to man what are his thoughts. Again, that's an emphasis on God's power. He who makes dawn into darkness and treads on the high place of the earth, the Lord God of hosts is his name. And so he will take care of it. The penalty of pride is destruction. And then the third sermon is found in chapter 5, verses 1 through 17. And uh, that one is entitled, the, the Peril of Procrastination. And that's probably a pretty good lesson for people who are supposed to have a lesson in on time and they just put it off and put it off and then they get all bound up and have an anxiety attack because they can't get it in on time. Sometimes that's just procrastination. So there might be a message in here for some of us who have a tendency to do that. And uh, the peril right here in this peril of procrastination is going to be seen in a lukewarmness and stagnation. And this is the seeking spirit versus the sluggish spirit. And so he's going to tell them to seek and live. If you don't, you'll stagnate and die. So there's a lamentation that's found right here in chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. Hear this word which I take up for you as a dirge. Now, what's a dirge used for? Funeral. Yep. <coughs> Hear this word which I take up for you as a dirge. Though so you're going to sing this like you're going to a funeral. Well, whose funeral are you going to? Well, you're going to your own funeral. So you're going to sing your own funeral dirge. O house of Israel. And here's the dirge. She has fallen. She will not rise again. The virgin Israel, she lies neglected on her land. There is none to raise her up. For thus says the Lord God, the city which goes forth a thousand strong will have a hundred left. And the one which goes forth a hundred strong will have ten left to the house of Israel. And so this is a lamentation. This is a dirge. This is a funeral song. And in the mind of God, that's it. In the mind of God, even though they may be living still in a fair amount of prosperity, because uh, uh, Amos, who is uh, uh, up concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah and the days of Jeroboam, when you're talking about Jeroboam II, and that takes you back to Amos 1, verse 1, this is a time of prosperity. He's restored all, all the borders. He's made lots of fortifications. Things are going well. And so God speaks in the present tense, not in the future tense, when he says in verses 2 and 3, you're goners, you're dead. Well, they just look around and say, well, what do you mean we're dead? Well, that's God's view. 
And uh, sadly, there are people today who are the walking dead. And I'm not talking about zombies. I'm talking about people who are spiritually dead but are still physically alive. And they're walking around and enjoying all the fruits of their labors and really giving no credit to God. It's just something they do <coughs> by their own ability. And they're really dead. It's like a good sermon. Tips. Tips. So, looking at verses 4 through 6, is the solution to all of this. For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me that you may live. Well, wait a minute, they say. We're alive, aren't we? No, you're not. You're the walking dead. Because in my mind, in my sight, you've fallen. You're not going to rise again. Now, there's still some hope left. I mean, you can be individually responsible and take care of yourself. But when he says she has fallen, she will not rise again, the virgin Israel, he's talking about the nation as a whole. That doesn't mean there's no hope for individuals within the nation. But as far as the nation goes, their history, their post, they're gone. And so the, the thought right here for the individual is, seek me that you may live. And in that process of verses 4 through 6, but do not resort to Bethel. What's at Bethel? Golden calf. Golden calf. <clears throat> do not come to Gilgal. Gilgal seems to be another place of worship, of idolatry. Nor cross over to Beersheba. And Gilgal will certainly go into captivity, and Bethel will come to trouble. So he again reverts to verse 4 in verse 6. Seek the Lord that you may live, lest he break forth like a fire, O house of Joseph, and it consume with none to quench it for Bethel. So seek the Lord and live is what we find in verses 4 through 6 of chapter 5. And it has just as much application today as it did back then. We live in a land of prosperity. We think nothing can bring this country down. We're, we're living uh, quite well at this particular time. And God continues to say, seek me that you may live. And the majority of people, sadly, within this country are the living dead. They're lost. They're going in the wrong direction. And God pleads, pleads, pleads for them to seek Him. So, good thoughts right there that have good application for us today. And then in verses 7 through 15, still looking at this third sermon, it says, those who, turn to righteousness, those who turn righteousness into unrighteousness will be punished by God. Now that's pretty sad. When the walking dead look out for anyone who might be righteous and they want to turn them to unrighteousness. This is the popular way. This is the way to, to live, you know. Uh, don't, uh, don't put up with that. It's, it's just uh, getting uh, someone like who's taken the Nazarite vow to get them to drink wine, you know. Uh, have them break their vow. So in verses 7 through 15, he says, For those who turn justice into wormwood. See, that's turning that which is right into wrong. And cast righteousness down to the earth. This is a message for them right here in verse 7. And what is the message? Well, it's from the one in verse 8, he who made the Pleiades and Orion, and changes deep darkness into morning, who also darkens day into night, who calls for the waters of the sea, pours them out on the surface of the earth, the Lord is his name. So the Pleiades and the Orion, those, those star groupings that were known to the ancient people, were already named. And we pick uh, those names up back in, uh, back in the book of Job, in Job uh, chapter 9, beginning at Job 38. 
So the Pleiades and the Orion. You all know what the Japanese for Pleiades is, right? I told you that some time ago. No, I never told you that. Can you think of any automobile insignias that would have in their insignia for a car Super. the Pleiades? Super. Super. Yeah. Super. So I get things. So there's a Japanese for Pleiades. Verse 9, it is he who flashes forth with destruction. Uh, uh, he darkens day into night, verse 8, calls for waters of the sea, pours them out on the surface of the earth. The Lord is his name. It is he who flashes forth with destruction upon the strong. So the destruction comes upon the fortress. In case you believe that you're going to be safe within the fortress, for you who turn righteousness into unrighteousness, it's not going to happen. And then he goes on to note in verse 10, they hate him who reproves in the gate. In other words, the one who, who uh, is righteous, see, that's the one who would reprove in the gate. That would be the elders of the city who really handle the law, meet out justice, hold the courts, make judgments between people and their difficulties. So right here, the one who reproves in the gate is the one who's hated. Why? Because people love unrighteousness. They don't love righteousness. And they abhor him who speaks with integrity. See, there's righteousness again. Therefore, because you impose heavy rent on the poor and exact a tribute of grain from them, that's unrighteousness, Though you have built houses of well-hewn stone, yet you will not live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, yet you will not drink their wine. In other words, you're going down. So all of this material wealth, all of this beauty that you have bestowed upon yourself, it's all for nothing. And that's because you're no longer seeking God. And in the process, you're making righteous to become unrighteousness. Verse 12, he says, For I know your transgressions are many, and your sins are great. You who distress the righteous and accept bribes, there you go, <coughs> turn aside the poor in the gate, don't take care of the problem. Therefore, at such a time, the prudent person keeps silent, for it is an evil time. And then he gives some more advice. Seek good. That's the Hebrew word tov. Tov. Usually spelled T O B, but it would be pronounced tov, like T O V. What is good. the Hebrew word? Tov. Tov for good. For good? Mm -hmm. And not evil. There's your word ra. So seek that which is functional and not that which is dysfunctional. That you may live. Well, that which is functional is to be righteous. That which is, is unrighteous is dysfunctional. <coughs> and thus may the Lord God of hosts be with you, just as you have said, hate evil, love good, and establish justice in the gate. Perhaps the Lord God of hosts may be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. There's Joseph, the name being used of the northern kingdom of Israel. Northern King of Israel can be called Samaria, can be called Israel, can be called Joseph, can be called Ephraim. Those are all synonymous terms. And so there's Joseph. Be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. And the reason why the remnant of Joseph is noted there is because it's a foregone conclusion that what God has said back here in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 5, it's going to happen. All we can hope for now is a remnant. Perhaps the Lord God of hosts may be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. And then in verses 16 and 17, judgment is announced. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, the Lord, there is wailing in all the plazas. Those are all town squares. Within each town, there's a town square. And usually within the town square, large cities had more than one. 
But usually within the town square was the marketplace. And marketplace, of course, was used for uh, the selling off of those goods that you had more of than what you needed. You might be a wheat farmer and you've been able to uh, sow and reap enough wheat for yourself. And then you've got some left over, so you take it to the marketplace. Or you may be a grower of figs, or you may be a grower of grapes, and you have more than enough. And so now you can use that to barter with. Barter is very much a part of the ancient world where you're trading goods for goods, or you might even be selling them. Of course, selling them, you would sell them for uh, precious metal like silver. It'd be a chunk of silver, it'd be weighed out on the scale so you'd know how much that was worth and, okay, is that wheat worth uh, that amount of money and you get a chunk of silver. And uh, no coinage at this time, just chunks of gold, chunks of silver, chunks of other commodities that might be worth something. So there's, therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, uh, there is wailing in all the plazas. Well, why would there be a wailing in the marketplace? No food. No food. So we, still, we always go back to the no food. This is always the discipline of God. And this right here is the judgment that's being announced. In all the streets they say, alas, alas. They also call the farmer to mourning. He has nothing. He has barely enough for himself. If even that much. And professional mourners to lamentation. It's a funeral. And in all the vineyards there is wailing. Why? No grapes. No figs. Figs and grapes generally grow in the same vineyard. Because I shall pass through the midst of you, says the Lord. So verses 16 and 17 substantiate what he has noted in chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. And it's because of the very fact that they keep putting off this peril of procrastination, they keep putting off their relationship with the Lord, and in the process, they get, become too complacent, and they're too lukewarm, and uh, they just allow righteousness to become unrighteousness. Then we come to sub point B of the outline. Two woes pronounced give graphic description of doom certainty, 518 through 614. And these are broken down into woes. So the first woe is found in chapter 5, verses 18 through 27. It's a day of the Lord. We've got a bit of a bad chapter break right here. These ought to be found in another single chapter, even if it was a longer chapter for chapter 6. In verses 18 through 27, the day of the Lord, a day of terror, alas, for you who are longing for the day of the Lord. Now, there would be those who would be among the unrighteous who would actually be waiting for the day of the Lord. Now, in their minds, the day of the Lord would bring them increased prosperity. So he says to them, you better not be wishing for the day of the Lord, because the day of the Lord is always a day of righteous judgment. And if you are making unrighteousness out of righteousness, then you don't want to see the day of the Lord. You don't know what you're talking about. And so it's really a day of terror. Alas, you who are longing for the day of the Lord, for what purpose will the day of the Lord be to you? Not what you think. You think, oh, day of the Lord. And, it, and it's very much like the kingdom of the Messiah. Two donkeys in every garage. <laughs> Chicken in every pot. No. For what purpose will the day of the Lord be to you? It will be darkness and not light. You think it's going to be light. It will be darkness and not light. And he said, I'll give you an example of what it's going to be like. And when a man flees from a lion, he's running down the road to get away from the lion, he runs right into a bear. 
and a bear meets him. Talk about doom. Or goes home, finally makes it home, he's out of breath, runs in the house, slams the door, leans his hand against the wall, and a snake bites him. <laughs> Just not going to win. You're not going to win. And so verse 20 says, Will not the day of the Lord be darkness instead of light, even gloom with no brightness in it? That's what it will be for those who desire it that they might be even more prosperous than they are at this particular point in time. So it's not a day of salvation for the unrighteous unjust it's going to be a day of doom and then he goes on with verse 21 still under this first woe I hate I reject your festivals nor do I delight in your solemn assemblies now they were supposedly still but this is Amos talking to the northern kingdom of Israel so they were going before the golden calves, and they said, well, the golden calf just represents God. Well, no graven images. Graven means one that is carved. You see. No graven images. And number two, when you're worshiping God, it needs to be with the priesthood of Aaron. Number three, it needs to be in Jerusalem, not Bethel or Dan or Gilgal. So he says... Whatever you're doing, even if in your heart of hearts you believe you're doing it for me, in your festival, in your solemn assemblies, he says, I reject them, I do not delight in them. And they would probably say, well, well, what do you mean by all that? And he would go on, then he goes on to say, even though you offer to, up to me, see, there's the right, there's the right direction. And how many people out in the world are worshiping God and believe they're worshiping God, and it's empty worship because it's not acceptable worship. So very early on, just like the the unacceptable worship of Matthew seven verses twenty one through twenty three, not everyone, Lord, Lord. So even though individuals believe that they're doing right, they're wrong. It said, even though, verse 22, you offer up to me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them. Well, if he won't accept them, then that's empty worship. Is it worship? Yeah, it's worship. But it's not worship in accord with God's will. Therefore, it's non acceptable. I will not accept them. And I will not even look at the peace offerings of your fat lanes. Uh, I don't see it. Just, it's not there. And you remember in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, Jesus finally says that the, uh, in verse 23, I never knew you. Never knew you. Which means I never saw you. I never heard you. Why? Because their worship is unacceptable. It's not doing the will of the Father who is in heaven. Matthew 7, 21. 7, 21. 7, 21 through 23. What was the other one? I, I don't think I went to another one. There. <laughs> I was another, it was another Matthew earlier. Same one. Same one? Yeah. All together? Okay. So, I will not even look. Verse 23 says, take away from me the noise of your songs. Why? It's a waste of time. It's just noise. See? If it's unacceptable, it's noise. It's irritating. You're going to irritate God. You want to use an instrument of music and worship within the Christian age? You're going to irritate God. Now, how long are you going to irritate God? Just going to do it from now on. You know, yesterday, yesterday, Dan went through a whole. We were in Ephesians five, and he took us back, and 
showed us, you know, how and where the temple was authorized, where it was, where they could play the instruments, and then when they were in captivity, they, you know, even in the Psalms, they acknowledged, you know, we we long to go back to do these things. Yeah. Well, here these aren't even authorized priests. It's in a wrong place, and so yeah. that's even another, even um, even a, a more powerful illustration there too. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So you call yourself Jews. <coughs> You are my chosen people, but you've made righteousness into unrighteousness, and anything you do in service to me, even if you're doing it with your whole heart, it doesn't matter. Because you have not made your life right before me. It's just like the individual says, well, Saturday night with confession. Got everything right, so now I can attend worship services. But Monday, I'm just going to go back to being the dirty, rotten scoundrel I've always been. That makes no sense at all. So he says in verse 22, I will not even listen to the sound of your harps. But let, here's the solution. Here's the solution. But let justice roll down like waters. So they are people who are no longer a just people. And righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. So justice and righteousness need to be your lifestyle. So what's keeping them from God is lifestyle. And when the lifestyle is not correct, then the worship is vain. And if our lifestyle is not correct, then our worship's going to be vain. You think you can make it up to me on Sunday morning? You think by coming and and partaking of the Lord's Supper, you just made up that dirty, rotten life that you had all that week before? You really think that's going to work? You need to make some changes. You need to repent. You need to be going in the right direction, not the wrong direction. Verse 25, did you present me with sacrifices and grain offerings in the wilderness for 40 years, O house of Israel? And they'll say, yeah, yeah, we did, we did. But then look what he says in verse 26. You also carried along Sikuth and Kayun, your images, the star of your gods which you made for yourselves. So, do you think that your lifestyle, as seen in verse 26, took care of the sacrifices you made in verse 25? Therefore, verse 27, getting back to the present, Therefore I will make you go into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. Exile beyond Damascus, historically... 721, 722 B.C., Assyrian captivity. This is Assyrian captivity for the northern kingdom of Israel. So, you want the day of the Lord? You better think twice about that. It says the Lord, which Yahweh, his name is... Elohim of hosts. I mean, is, if I have that right, I'm just looking at it. Why both of them? Why what? Why both of those names? Don't know that I can answer that for you. It's, it's uh, of course, it just brings something to mind that's just a little bit different. Uh, Elo, Elohim and uh, is uh, the, the name that is used, of course, when we're Starting out with uh, Genesis 1 and verse 1 is the Elohim word, uh, and it is a plural form of Eloah, and uh, it is a plurality of majesty within that particular county. It's not talking about more than one member, but then when we get down to Exodus 3 and we're introduced to the memorial name, which is the Tetragrammaton, which is 
Yahweh, that's the name that becomes even more sacred to the Jews, the, the name that is never uttered, the name that when you're writing uh, a Hebrew text, you would even use a different pen and wash your hands and all of that. So it becomes a very memorial name, but he is both Elohim and Yahweh. I was just wondering. And sometimes Adonai. There's a third word for you to use in the Hebrew. Or Adon. Adon or Adonai is the third word that is used. And sometimes they're, they're used. Uh, and for instance, let me give you an example of the use of, of uh, two of the words. And, but this is a very interesting way in which they're used because we're talking about two different members of the family. Over at Psalm 110, <coughs> Psalm 110, beginning with verse 1, and that's a messianic psalm. And uh, this is the one that, this is the psalm that Jesus uses with religious leaders of his time in Matthew 22, 41 through 46. And he says, whose son is he? And that's it. Never again do they bring up any discussion with Jesus. That, that pretty well shuts the door on any further discussions. But it says, the Lord, that's Yahweh, right there. That's the tetragrammic dot. Why, in the English, we Y-H-W-H from right to left. The Lord says to my Lord, and the word is Adonai. Well, contextually, within this Christian age, we can understand that that would be the Father saying to the Son, the Father is referred to as Yahweh there. The Son is referred to as Adonai. Sit at my right hand till I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet. So we have no difficulty. The position of honor is at his right hand. That's noted in Psalm 45, verse 9. And so there's the use of both of those right there. So it's, I'm sure there's, there's more to it than just that. But, I don't uh, I need to do a study on that, so the next time that question comes up, I'll be able to give a little bit of a better answer, because I really don't know why they are used sometimes. Uh, and and the, the three terms are used of uh, each member of the family of God. God of hosts, verse 27. So that's going beyond Damascus. Damascus is the capital of Syria. So when they leave into exile, they'll go through Damascus. And Damascus will have already been taken by the Assyrians. The Assyrians took care of the problem that Ahaz, who is the father of Hezekiah, had. And he's the one that brought them into the land to begin with. And he's the one who is uh, told that he can ask God for a sign in Isaiah 7. And he refuses to do it. And Isaiah says, well, you're going to get one anyway. And that's the young woman shall conceive and bear a child. She'll call his name Emmanuel. Which in Matthew 1.23 then becomes a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. In the Hebrew, it's not a virgin. It's a young woman. So it's a dual fulfillment prophecy. It's a prophecy that is fulfilled in the time of Ahaz. And then it's in the most important part that we consider... Uh, it's found in Matthew 1.23, where it is the virgin birth. Going on to chapter 6, verses 1 through 14, we have the second woe, the day of the Lord. And this is a day of totality. A day of totality. Now, chapter 6 is going to be very applicable to today. Just as we read it, just try to insert some terminology from today's society to see what you come up with. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion. Ah. So the message now is even though he is from Jerusalem or he's from Judah, he's actually from Tekoa, even though he's from the southern kingdom of Judah, He's going to pronounce a judgment. This is God speaking through Amos. He's going to speak the judgment against Zion. And Zion would be the southern kingdom of Judah. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion. So here it is. What he's saying right here is 
Now, for you people in Jerusalem, don't consider that you are uh, exempt from any of this. So woe to those who are in these in Zion. And he's already taken Zion to task, you remember, when we were looking at all of the nations that he went after. When we came over to Amos 2, verse 4 says, Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Judah, and for four I will not revoke his punishment. So he not only went after all of those surrounding nations, but he also went after the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. So this isn't the only time he's <coughs> gone after those who are living in Judah. But he says, Woe to those who are at ease in Zion. He's saying this because these people in Israel are at ease. They are at ease. Remember back here in chapter 4, verse 1. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who run the mountains of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring now that we may drink. And it's a luxurious lifestyle. Which we don't know anything about luxurious <laughs> lifestyles. And to those who feel secure in the mountain of Samaria. So this t- goes for the, nor- the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel. The distinguished men of the foremost of nations. For, for all of you who are puffed up among yourselves and believe that you are the cat's meow. Be careful. To whom the house of Israel comes. Go over to Kalna and look. Kalna is a city that is no longer there. The, uh, a city that had been uh, removed. And go from there to Hamath the Great. These are all cities that have had destruction come upon them. Then go down to Gath and the Philistines. Are they better than these kingdoms? In other words... Look what I did to Kona and Hamath and Gath. Now, if I did that to these three, what's in store for you? Or is their territory greater than yours? Verse 3, do you put off the day of calamity? Would you bring near the seed of violence? In other words, the direction that you are now going in is going to lead is going to lead to your doom. And then he describes their problem. Here's their problem. Those who recline on beds of ivory, that's the luxurious life, and sprawl on their couches, meet lambs from the pot, and calves from the midst of the stall. We improvise to the sound of the harp, like David who composed songs for themselves, who drink wine from sacrificial bowls. See, sacrificial bowls are holy, can only be used for religious purposes, that they're getting pleasure from drinking out of sacrificial bowls. Well, they anoint themselves with the finest of oils. And verse 6, the latter part, is a very, very important part of this section. Yet they have not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Now, the grieving that they are supposed to be a part of is the grieving that you learned of when Jesus presented his introduction to the Sermon on the Mount. And that introduction to the Sermon on the Mount that we call, or that is called uh, by some, the Beatitudes, has within it something that one is supposed to do. It says in Matthew 5, verse 4, Blessed are those who mourn. And Thontes. That's lamentation and extreme sorrow for the dead. Now, it's not talking about those who have died physically. Within this context, it's talking about 
Those who are blessed are those who mourn over those who are dead spiritually. And you start out with yourself. If you don't mourn over yourself being dead spiritually, then you'll never be alive spiritually. So it's a sin problem. So we have to mourn over our sin problem, and then we have to mourn over the sin problem of those we come in contact with. And if we don't mourn over that, then we're not pleasing to God because He mourns over the sin problem. So He wants us to be just like Him. Now, going back to verse 6 of Amos 6, he says, They have not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. In other words, if they grieved over the ruin of Joseph, if they had grieved over the people of the northern kingdom of Israel who were turning righteousness into unrighteousness, then they would have done something about it. But this would be a people who are absolutely self-absorbed. And by the way, that idea of being self-absorbed is found in Matthew 5 and verse 3, when it says, Blesses are, Blessed are the poor in spirit, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Being poor in spirit, since the word pokos is used, and that word means abject poverty, that means you need to be poverty struck as far as you yourself is concerned. In other words, I need to be one who has lowered myself in the position of receiving that which comes from above. I'm not going to dictate to God. I'm going to allow God to dictate to me. And I make myself an empty cup in that particular case in order that God might fill me up. That's what being poor in spirit is all about. He doesn't say poor in the worldly goods of this life. He says poor in spirit. Because you see, Jesus recognizes in this introductory material that our biggest problem in the world, our, big, our biggest problem in the world is the word self. Self. Self is at the root of our sin problem. Self. And so what he's saying is here we need to deny self. We need to get rid of self. And the way you get rid of self is by becoming poor in spirit. Selfish. Self, self is my biggest problem. Self is your biggest problem. Self always gets in the way when it comes to sin. I either want that that I don't, shouldn't have. Or I'm not going to do that, something that I should do. And it's because me, my, self, got in the way. And we are living today in a materialistic, extremely selfish society. All you have to do is read the headlines every night, and you'll see selfishness popping out all over the place. So, here's a self problem, going back to Amos 6, verse 6. They've not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. And the reason why is because they're so self-absorbed. I mean, these are people who are absolutely narcissistic. I mean, they just love looking in some reflective piece of metal in order that they might see a figure of themselves and say, hmm... Maybe I ought to have some plastic surgery. Look a little bit better. Well, no plastic surgery back in these days, but certainly we live in a society. Now, when you were looking at beds of ivory, do we have anything uh, today that would be likened to a bed of ivory? Really expensive bedroom suite? What? I said a really expensive ice, you know, I don't yeah, know. How about a big expensive sleep number bed, you know. You've got to be comfortable. No. Uh, sprawling on the couches. How about uh, the uh, lazy boy that you have as you're lounging in front of the television set? Eat lambs from the flock. Are any of us going hungry? 
when compared to a great number of people in the world, are any of us going hungry? <coughs> and calves from the midst of the stall, who improvise to the sound of the harp, are any of us involved in any of the music of our day and age? And, and uh, how sometimes it can be so terribly misleading, taking us in the wrong direction? about drinking wine from sacrificial bowls? We certainly don't have any problem with beverages. Anointing themselves with the finest of oils. These oils, by the way, are perfumed oils. Do we have anything that we put on? Underarm, aftershave, perfume. And, and by the way, Perfume that is placed upon the individual is not for the benefit of the individual. It's always for the benefit of those who are around the individual. In other words, we're trying to make a good impression on those that we're around. Because if we're just trying to satisfy ourselves, we just be sweaty, dirty things all day long. You know? But we're trying to impress someone else. Maybe a woman, maybe male friends. Does any of this sound familiar? You missed the whole point of this. We go over again. <laughs> and are we grieving over the ruin of the USA? I would hope so. Because the only answer to the USA is Jesus Christ. And we've got to be evangelistic. Because the ruin is right there. Verse 7, therefore they will now, this is the result of their life, the luxuriant life that they're living. Therefore they will now go into exile at the head of the exiles. We've already seen that going back to 527, exile beyond Damascus. And the sprawlers banqueting will pass away. No more party time. Party time's gone. Verse 8, we have that term that God uses on occasion, and the Lord God has sworn by himself. Might look that up sometimes, see how many times that's used within Scripture, because he can swear by no one greater than himself. The Lord God of hosts has declared. And so that phrase where it says has sworn by himself is a guarantee of authenticity. It is a guarantee that what he says will happen, will take place, will be accomplished. The Lord God has sworn by himself, the Lord God of hosts has declared, I loathe the arrogance of Jacob, and I detest his citadels. There's another term that's used for the northern kingdom of right Jacob. Therefore I will deliver up the city, and all it contains. The arrogance of Jacob, and because, because God is presenting the inspired writer with the thought of arrogance, <coughs> Jacob's name is pulled, because Jacob means supplanter, and there was a certain arrogance with Jacob. Remember, Jacob was the one who cheated his brother out of his birthright, and so Anytime arrogance is noted, well, Jacob comes to mind. doesn't say the arrogance of Israel. That's the name that his name is changed to, wrestles with God. But here it's more appropriate to think of him when he was just Jacob, one who was arrogant. You're just like Jacob, arrogant Jacob. I loathe the arrogance of Jacob, and I detest his citadels. Therefore, I would love the city and all it contains. And it will be, if ten men are left in one house, they will die. Then one's uncle or his undertaker will lift him up to carry out his bones from the house. And he will say to the one who is in the innermost part of the house, Is anyone else with you? And that one will say, No one. Then he will answer, Keep quiet for the name of the Lord is not to be mentioned. And so it's a very terrible time. And in this terribleness of the time, then it's time to be quiet. 
be silent because God is at work in the destruction and mentioning the name of the Lord for mercy. This is a no mercy time. God provides a time for mercy before the destruction takes place. But once the destruction is in progress, it's a no mercy time. We will see that in the Revelation when we find that smoke begins to fill up the temple and no one can go into the temple. You can't go into the temple in the Revelation. You can't plead to God for mercy and that's the destruction of the Roman Empire and there is no more mercy in that particular case. And so right here, this is a time of no more mercy. Just be quiet. Five times. Five times. Okay. That's an interesting thought. Verse 11, For behold, the Lord is going to command that the great house be smashed to pieces and the small house to fragments. In other words, it's going to be for the rich and the poor. Very democratic, this destruction. It's going to take everybody. The great house and the small house. That's just the rich and the poor. And then he says, uh, makes a very interesting statement, and it brings out a fact of a problem that they had with horses in those days. It says, do horses run on rocks? Well, this is before the invention of the horseshoe, and you do not run your horses on rocks because you'll damage the horse. And the horse actually is... Uh, the origin of the horse is found up in some great pasture land that is up in the area called the steppes, which is uh, uh, that part of the world that becomes Russia. And it's all pasture land, and it was soft land. And interestingly enough, when the those warrior nations... Uh, came down to destroy the Roman Empire, and that would be the Goths and the Ostrogoths and the Vandals and the Lombards and all of those, all of those uh, barbarians, as the Romans would consider them. When they came down, many of them were mounted on horses, and they were very quickly uh, just assimilated into Europe because uh, where they came from was a great deal of pasture land, which was uh, an advantage for the horse, the ancient horse. But once they got down into rockier soil, the horse was not of that much of an advantage any longer. So the question is, do horses run on rocks? And of course, uh, the question uh, the question is easily answered. Uh, no, no. Do horses run on rocks? No. Or does one plow them with oxen? Well, plowing rocks with oxen. What you do is you go through the field and you pull the rocks out manually, and then you can plow. But you don't try to plow rocks with a plow. Uh, but the ancient plow is just made out of wood. It's not very sturdy. And the ancient plow, until the invention of an iron or steel plow, doesn't break up the topsoil very well. It just scratches the ground, and then they come along after the plow. Actually, in Syria, there was a plow with a cedar fixed to the front of the plow, or must have must have been sort of the seat after at the back end of the plow. And it would just scratch the ground and then drop a seed in there. And uh, usually people would, after they made a, a real furrow, and the furrow would only be about two or three inches deep on an ancient plow. It just really didn't turn the topsoil. Just enough to get a seed in there. And then, then somebody would come behind and <laughs> drop the seed in there, and then they'd come back through and cover up the furrow. And that was ancient farming. And so one does not plow rocks with oxen. The, the plow would be broken immediately. So no. Yet you have turned justice into poison. So 
He's saying, you know logically that horses don't run on rocks and wood does not plow rocks with oxen, yet you have not been thinking logically and you've turned justice into poison and the fruit of righteousness into wormwood. And so you've turned righteousness into unrighteousness. You never even gave it a second thought, living in your luxurious, luxurious lifestyle. You who rejoice in Lodabar, Lodabar means a thing of nothing. And say, have we not by our own strength taken our name for ourselves? Our own strength. And our name is a pair of horns. You see the I am ending there. A pair of horns. So by our own strength, we've taken our name, and yet we rejoice in a thing of nothing. For behold, I'm going to raise up a nation against you, O house of Israel, declares the Lord of hosts, and they will afflict you from the entrance of Hamath to the brook of the Arabah from north to south. And that will be still going back to 527. That's going to be the Assyrians. They will come into the land take them out. So there's another day of the Lord. A day of total destruction and disaster. And then there's symbols and prophecies in chapters 7 through 9. And there are a number of visions number of visions. The visions will have uh, explanation, so we'll not have to try to figure out what the visions are all about. And the first vision is found in chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. And when he uses the word thus, right here, or it ends up being the English word thus, you might also in insert a thought found in the word consequently. Consequently. And that carries with the idea of the consequences of what I have said before will be this. So thus is like consequently. So everything that has already been noted back here in chapter 6 or actually chapters 1 through 6 is summed up beginning in chapter 7. This is the summation of all of this. It actually allows to go from chapter 7 to chapter 9. So that word thus. So the lessons of the prophetic proclamations that we've already seen in chapters 1 through 6. Thus the Lord showed me. And behold, he was forming a locust swarm well, this is God's use of his creation. He can do whatever he wants to with it. When the spring crop began to sprout, what a terrible time. The farmers, you know, who are, who are just given in to the uh, difficulties of weather will just sometimes see a hailstorm come through and just destroy a crop of wheat when it's first coming where the field is first turning green. What a terribly depressing, distressing, woeful time. So a locust swarm, when the spring crop began to sprout, and behold, the spring crop was after the king's mowing. There's, a, there's an early crop and a late crop. And it came about when it had finished eating the vegetation of the land that I said, Oh, Lord God, Please pardon. How can Jacob stand? For he is small. He's talking about the northern kingdom of Israel. And so this is the vision. The vision is of a locust plague. Now, it's a locust plague that has not taken place, but it's so visually distressing to Amos that he says, Oh, Lord God, he feels... He feels the pain of the northern kingdom of Israel if this were to take place. And so he says, Lord God, please pardon. How can Jacob stand? For he is small. The Lord changed his mind about this. It shall not be, says the Lord. So it's just a vision 
of what God could do. And God says, no, I'm not going to do this. And Amos would go, almost bit the big one right there. And then uh, in verses 4 through 6, he gives a second vision. This one's a vision of fire. Thus the Lord God showed me, and behold, the Lord was calling to contend with them by fire, and it consumed the great deep and began to consume the farmland. Then I said, Lord God, please stop. How can Jacob stand for his small? The Lord changed his mind about this. This too shall not be. So what he's doing is he's saying, this is what I can do. You need to relate this to the northern kingdom of Israel. And it's just some more information that God has within his ability to do any of this. And if he does, you're just going to be absolutely devastated. So, no locusts, no fire. And then in verses 7 through 17, he has a plumb line. Does everybody know what a plumb line is? A plumb line is a line, a string with a lead weight on it to determine the vertical. If you've ever done any wallpapering in your house, you will use, should use, let's maybe use a laser, but you should use a, a plumb line. It's real easy to use. You just have a weight on the end and it gives you the true vertical, especially when you're putting up the next sheet of wallpaper. If not, all your wallpaper will start going in this direction. Pretty soon it will be from the vertical to the horizontal. You won't like that at all. Probably not that bad. The word plum is an English word derived from a Latin word, plumum. Plumum. And the Latin word plumum means lead. So the word plumum means lead in Latin. And it was, it's also the word from which we derive plumber. A plumber was originally one who worked with lead. Because lead piping was used among all the rich people uh, in the Roman Empire. So if you were very wealthy, you did not have terracotta plumbing, you had lead plumbing. So if people had terracotta plumbing, didn't get lead poisoning, but you did. <laughs> because lead flakes. So <clears throat> there's a plumb line in his hand. Here's the Lord standing by a vertical ball with a plumb line in his hand. Now, the plumb line means that God is the originator of the vertical. God is the originator of the vertical. And so everybody else needs to measure up to his vertical. The word of God is like a plumb line. We don't go up at this angle. We don't go up at that angle. We stay right within the line that's the true vertical. So, thus he showed me, behold, the Lord was standing by a vertical wall with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, what do you see, Amos? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said to me, behold, I'm about to put a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. The high places of Isaac will be desolated. The sanctuaries of Israel laid waste. Then, I, then shall I rise up against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Now this is during the time of Jeroboam II, so this is who he's talking about. Then Amaziah the priest of Bethel sent word to Jeroboam king of Israel saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is unable to endure his words. For well, thus Amos says Jeroboam will die by the sword and Israel will certainly go from its land into exile. Then Amaziah, this is the priest of Bethel. It's interesting, Amaziah, who is a false priest, his name is the Lord is strong. That's what the name Amaziah means. The Lord is strong. And so he's railing against someone who's preaching God's word. And his name is the Lord is strong. 
He probably had good parents. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Go, you seer. Seer is a, is the older word for prophet. A, there was a word that's sometimes translated prophet. Sometimes there's a word that's translated seer. They're both the same individual. The seer is the older term that's used. Flee away to the land of Judah, and there eat bread, and there do your prophesying. Now, eating bread is just a, a general term for get your food from the southern kingdom, quit trying to get your food from the northern kingdom. But no longer prophesy at Bethel, for it is the sanctuary of the king and the royal residence. Oh. <laughs> is it a place of sacrificing to God? <coughs> Notice he doesn't say that. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I am not a prophet. That's not my primary livelihood. Nor am I the son of a prophet, for I am a herdsman and a grower of sycamore figs. And that's where we know that he's a nipper of sycamore figs. And if he's a short fellow, he's a little nipper. <laughs> that's a terrible one, isn't it? But the Lord took me from following the flock. He's talking just like, just like uh, other individuals have, have uh, talked that he has been called, Samuel was called, Elijah was called, Elisha was called. And when it says he took me, that means he was called directly by God. The Lord took me from following the flock, that was my vocation. And the Lord said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. Now they ought to take the hint from that, that they can still be my people if they will repent. But my people... And now hear the word of the Lord. Amos not going to stop because Amaziah says stop. Now hear the word of the Lord. You are saying you shall not prophesy against Israel, nor shall you speak against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus says the Lord, a message for Amaziah. Your wife will become a harlot in the city. Your sons and your daughters will fall by the sword. Your land will be parceled up by measuring line. And you yourself will die upon unclean soil. That more than likely is a Syrian captivity. So he's going to get to see his wife become a harlot, his sons and daughters die by the sword, his property all taken away from him and parceled out to others, and then he's going to be carried captive into the land of captivity, and he will die there. That's the unclean soil. Moreover, Israel will certainly go from its land into exile. So another message. And that's the searching phone line. You don't get lined up with that. Now, chapter 8, and this is why the chapter headings came up this way. This Hebrew word is used again, and it ends up being this thought, consequently... Now, consequently, we'll take us back to what we had just read, going into exile. Go back to chapter 7, verse 17. There, Israel will certainly go from its land into exile. Consequently, so as a result of all this, God gives a fourth vision, chapter 8, verses 1 through 14. Thus, is, thus the Lord God showed me, and behold, there was a basket of summer fruit. And he said, what do you see, Amos? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, the end has come for my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. So, the summer fruit, and, what, and you know that once fruit is picked, there's no longer any, any uh, opportunity to grow. In other words, its growth stops with its picking. And so, this is it. And uh, this means the end is inevitable. No more growing. So there's a time coming when the growth or the progress or the turning of the northern kingdom of Israel back to God is going to come to an end. There's a time coming when God says, this is it. This is it. Today is the day of the Lord. Oh, wait a minute. Can't we have another week? No. 
This is it. Right now. And so it's just like summer fruit. And as long as that fruit stays in the bowl, it's not going to get any better. It's going to get worse. And so he says, this is the end. This is what it's going to be like. Verse 3, the songs of the palace will turn to wailing in that day. Is this the end? Declares the Lord God, many will be the corpses in every place. They will cast them forth in silence. There's our thought that we saw right back here in chapter 6, verse 10. Keep quiet for the name of the Lord is not to be mentioned. No more mercy. You can cry out to God all day long, but the nation is going under. Now you can cry out to God and still get right with God yourself, but you cannot pray for the nation. In fact, it's useless. Don't, don't even pray for the nation. It's a worthless prayer. Because when God says it's going down, it's going down. In the day of destruction, it's going down. Keep your mouth shut. That's what he said back here in chapter 6, in verse 10. And that's what he's saying right here. Just shut up. You can, for yourself, it's fine. But just not for anyone else. For the nation. Verse 4, hear this, you who trample the needy. There's your unrighteousness. To do away with the humble of the land. So this is all the present iniquity. Saying, when will the new moon be over? Now that's a day of worship. New moon's a day of worship. And what they're saying is, is this day never going to end? It's like us saying, oh, will this day of worshiping God and Bible class and Sunday morning and Worship service on Sunday morning. And then we're, are we really going to go back tonight? When will this day be over? That's the person who dis despises the day of the Lord. And so to despise any day of the Lord is horrible. But the reason they're doing it is because this is a Sabbath. See? Look at the rest of that verse. So that we may buy grain. When will this... It's like, when will the Sabbath be finished? Well, I just can't wait until the Sabbath's finished because I want to make money. Mm. This is their whole lifestyle, making money. Destroying the needy, doing away with the humble. Self, 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 self. What's the, what's the movie where the seagulls are always saying, mine, 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 mine. Finding Nemo. Finding Nemo. <laughs> mine. Mine, 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 mine. And the Sabbath that we may open the wheat market. See, you couldn't do it on the Sabbath. So these people are complaining that this their business is being hurt because we cannot make money on the Sabbath. To make the bushel smaller. What's that? That's cheating. In other words, you have a container and you say, this container holds so much in value. Actually, it's got a false bottom in it. It looks like it holds that much. But it's got a, a, a little partition there. And it really doesn't hold. So you make the bushel smaller and the shekel bigger. This is where you have a scale weight, and the weights and the container are all misleading. So these guys are cheats. They're really looking forward to the time when I can get back to the marketplace and start cheating people again. And to cheat with dishonest scales, and the whole scale, the balance beam is... is uh, worked over so that it's not giving a correct weight. See, there's no one running around with a certificate uh, authorizing this particular scale. You know, you see those, see those little certificates on the side of gas pumps, you know. Somebody's come through from the government and they check the pump to make sure that a gallon really is a gallon. 
They, they pump it out to see if the meter is noting exactly what's going into the container, and then they'll give it a seal. If it's not doing it, then the pump has to be uh, reworked. Well, it's just like scales. Scales, if you ever note scales in a meat market or someplace like that, if you ever note the scales, and, and a lot of, a lot of uh, stores have scales in them where you can really go weigh out your goods, and it should have a certificate guaranteeing that it's accurate. Well, they didn't have anything like that these days. People just trusted each other. And Jews generally trusted Jews because they were brethren. But these people are dishonest. So as to buy the helpless for money, that's virtually slavery, and the needy for a pair of sandals, and that we may sell the refuse of the wheat. Now what you do is you leave some of that chaff and some of that junk that weighs a little bit, just mix it in with the wheat so that what's put on the scales, it looks like they're getting more. So the result of this is judgment. The Lord is sworn by the pride of Jacob. In other words, all that Jacob regards as excellent. The Lord is sworn by the pride of Jacob. Indeed, I will never forget any of their deeds. I will never forget. He knows everything. And this is just a way of saying that he knows everything. So you cheated that little old lady around the corner. There was no one to see you. But God was watching. And he's going to bring you into account for cheating that low lady that was around the corner. Because of this, will not the land quake? Yes. Because you are cheaters, the land is going to quake. Everyone who dwells in it mourn. Indeed, all of it will rise up like the Nile. That's the flooding of the Nile. It will be tossed about and subside like the Nile of, the, of Egypt. That's the Nile going down after the flood. It will come about in that day, declares the Lord God, that I shall make the sun go down at noon. This is day of the Lord terminology. You'll recognize it. And make the earth dark and broad daylight. Then I shall turn your festivals into mourning and your songs into lamentations. I will bring sackcloth and everyone's loins and baldness on every Head, no more gaiety. Baldness is not natural here. This is where individuals would pluck their scalp, yank their hair out, and they do that because they're mourning. This is when they're wearing sackcloth. This is when they're throwing ashes on their heads, you see. And I will make it like a time of mourning for an only son. How terrible is that loss to the Jewish family? An only son. Detrimental. There is no loss that's any greater within a family <coughs> unit than the loss of a son. They have five daughters, doesn't matter. It's the loss of a son. Because there's the inheritance. Primogenitor is the term that's used with the firstborn. It's found in many, many societies. It's not found so much in this society anymore. The primitive society is primogenitor is everything, or most everything, goes to the first one. At the end of it will be like a bitter day. And then he goes on to say, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I'll send famine on the land, not a famine for bread or a thirst for water, but rather for hearing the words of the Lord. You want a good text to build a sermon on? Try that one right there in verse 11. A famine for hearing the words of the Lord. Now, when we leave Malachi, guess what happens? Now you already know. What happens when we leave Malachi? It's just the prophets down. Prophets are shut down. And there's nothing more said until we get into the gospel accounts. That's God shutting down the word. Today, God doesn't shut down the word. Who shuts down the word today? We do. We do. And so there are people on this world who won't preach.
preach God's word, and there are people out in this world who won't listen to God's word. That is effectively a famine for hearing the words of the Lord. Good, good uh, text for sermon. And people will stagger from sea to sea and from north even to the east. They will go to and fro and seek the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. No comfort, no consolation. In that day, the beautiful virgins and the young men will fade from thirst. Beauty and strength cannot save them. As for those who swear by the guild of Samaria, in other words, they are are swearing by the propitiation of Samaria, the satisfaction of Samaria, who say, as your God lives, O Dan, that's the golden calf, and as the way of Beersheba lives, seems to be a cult of Beersheba. If you go back here to chapter 5, in verse 5, it says, North cross over to Beersheba. That seems to be another place where there's a cult of Beersheba, even though Beersheba literally, physically is found in the southern kingdom. They will fall and not rise again. And so there is utter destruction. Uh, or there is the basket of assembly group, chapter 8, verse 1 through 14. And then utter destruction. This is the fifth vision, chapter 9, verses 1 through 10. I saw the Lord standing beside the altar who said, Smite the capital so the thresholds will shake. And I break them on the heads of them all, and I will slay the rest of them with the sword. They will not have a fugitive who will flee or a refugee who will escape. Though they dig in the Sheol, from there my hand shall take them. Sounds like Psalm 139, doesn't it? Though they ascend to heaven, from there I will bring them down. Though they hide on the summit of Mount Carmel, or try to take a Phoenician ship to Tarshish, (laughs) I will search them out and take them from there. Though they conceal themselves from my sight on the floor of the sea, from there I command the serpent, it will bite them. Though they go into captivity before their enemies, from there I will command the sword that has slain them. Some are going to not survive captivity. And I will set my eyes against them for Ra, that's our word evil right there, for dysfunction. Is captivity dysfunction? You bet. Is it morally wrong? No. Therefore, it's not evil in a moral sense. They look look upon it as evil, but it is Ra, it is dysfunction. Because he really wants them in the land worshiping him. They won't do it. So you're going to have to leave the land for a while. This is a woodshed moment. I will set my eyes against them for evil and not for good. Tall tall is used right here. For function. They are dysfunctional. So they made themselves dysfunctional. He as the master potter made them functional. But they have the ability, because of free moral agency, to make themselves dysfunctional. That's what they've done. So if you're going to be dysfunctional, then you're going to abide, you're going to live, you're going to make your abode in a land that is of dysfunction. That's going to be Assyrian captivity. Then later on, Babylonian captivity. Verse 5, And the Lord God of hosts, the one who touches the land so that it melts, and all those who dwell in it mourn, and all of it rises up like the Nile and subsides like the Nile of Egypt. He's already noticed that back here in chapter 8. In verse 8, flood rising, flood receding. One who builds his upper chambers in the heavens and has founded his vaulted dome over the earth. This is creation terminology. He who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the fence of the earth, that's creation terminology. The Lord is his name. So he uses creation terminology to once again authenticate the power that he has to do all this. This is, this is just a slight thing as far as God's power is concerned. Send them all off into the captivity. Verse 7, are you not as the sons of Ethiopia to me, O sons of Israel? Have I not brought up Israel from the land of Egypt? 
and the Philistines from Kaptor and the Arameans from Kerr. In other words, I'm the one who moves nations around. And I, I did it with the Ethiopians, and I did it with the Philistines, and I did it with the Syrians, the Syrians with the Arameans right there. I can do it with you. Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are on the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from the face of the earth. Nevertheless, I will not totally destroy the house of Jacob. That's remnant terminology right there. For those people who constantly try to say, oh, the ten lost tribes of Israel. No, God says there's a remnant. And we're going to note that more and more in the Old Testament text. In fact, we're going to get into a favorite Mormon passage of Scripture and note that it's not talking about the Book of Mormon in the Bible. It's actually talking about the house of Judah and the house of Israel. For behold, I am commanding, and I will shake the house of Israel among all nations as a grain is shaken in a sieve. But not a kernel will fall to the ground. All the sinners of my people will die by the sword. Those who say the calamity will not overtake or confront us. And then they will raise up the fallen booth of David. That's messianic. So while they're off in captivity, I'm going to be shaking them. And uh, those that are remnant, they will be restored because not a kernel will fall to the ground. But the sinners, they're really going to fall to the ground there in verse 10 because they're going to die by the sword. So it's very reminiscent of 40 years of wilderness wandering and all of those who are age 20 and older die in the wilderness. This is more than 70 years of captivity. The Babylonian portion is just 70. So in the day, in that day, this is restoration. This is remnant return. Raise up the fallen booth of David. The fallen booth of David, of course, would be likened unto the temple and wall up its breaches. There's the wall surrounding the temple and really surrounding Jerusalem. And that's going to happen. Ezra, Nehemiah, Ezra rebuild the temple, all the temple complex. Nehemiah rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. I'll also raise up its ruins, rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom. In other words, they will once again be a power that will take charge of Edom to the south. And all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. The whole days are coming, declares the Lord. When the plowman will overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him who sows seed. In other words, they're coming back into the land, and everything's going to be so productive and everything's going to grow so quickly that the plowman will overtake the reaper. In other words, the plowman is turning the soil. The reaper is cutting the crop. So that everything's going to grow very quickly. Everything's going to be very productive. It's going to be a land of milk and honey once again. The mountains will drip sweet, sweet wine and all the hills will be dissolved. The dissolving of hills means the difficulties of life. Remember that John the Baptist comes and, and the valleys are lifted up and the mountains are made low. That means that the way to the Messiah is not a difficult way. It's not one that just one struggles and then just can't quite make it. But the way is made clear that all the hills will be dissolved. And I will restore the captivity of my people Israel. There's another verse for you. No lost ten tribes of Israel. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will also plant vineyards and drink their wine and make gardens and eat their fruit. I will also plant them on their land and they will not again be rooted out from their land which I have given them, says the Lord your God. Now, you say, well, wait a minute. Coming back into the land, uh, they're looking for the Messiah. The Messiah comes. And then uh, the Messiah talks about in Matthew 24, the destruction of Jerusalem. And then with the destruction of Jerusalem, a great number of these people are dispersed throughout the world. Well, they come back in as a nation of people. 
They come back in to restore temple worship as a nation of people. And so when they leave, when they are rooted out, he said, I also will plant them on their land, and they will not again be rooted out from their land, but they cease in their being a people at the cross. So they're no longer God's people, because God's people are the seed of Abraham, and that's what Christians are, of the seed of Abraham. And so the Jews are given opportunity first, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Romans 1, verse 16, the Gospel. And so they're given the opportunity to continue on being God's people, the children of God. And so when this destruction of Jerusalem comes, it's no longer affecting really a people like God's chosen people of both Judah and Israel in the time of the Assyrian captivity and the Babylonian captivity. So there's a change, and the cross really changes everything. So he's not making a false promise there. He's just not giving all the information as to why they really won't be rooted out in the same way that they were rooted out before. They went into captivity as a nation. They came back as a nation. This time they will be rooted out, but they are no longer a nation. And so that epilogue in verses 11 through 15 is a promise of a messianic hope. Let me give you a, a few main lessons in just the four minutes that we have left, or three minutes that we have left. Number one, the essence of God's nature is absolute righteousness. The essence of God's nature is absolute righteousness. So it really does grieve God when his people are not righteous. Because they're not imitating their God. So the essence of God's nature is absolute righteousness. Then number two, God's people are to imitate his character. God's people are to imitate his character. And uh, that thought is uh, noted in 1 Peter 1, verse 15, but like the Holy One who called you to be holy, yourselves also in all your behavior. And that's what he's been talking about. He's been talking about behavior. And then a third lesson is when worship is sin. And we've already noted that back in chapter 4 and 5. That worship becomes sin when the lifestyle is not matching the worship that's being given. Worship is sin. And then a real good lesson out of chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, is ease, idleness, and luxury can lead to open sin. Ease, idleness, and luxury can lead to open sin. Can you read that third one again? Which one? The third one. Third one? When worship is sin. All of that vain worship. I mean, the guy was worshiping on the Sabbath, but in his heart he was saying, will this day never end? You said something about the kimsole and the lifestyle is not something. I missed that last one. Oh, oh that, was, that was just, I was just emphasizing that the lifestyle needs to match the worship. If the lifestyle doesn't ma match the worship, then the worship is sinful. Mm. Okay, anyone have any questions? Okay, we'll finish with Amos.